By June 1862, the American Civil War appeared all but over. In the West, the Union had won key victories at Mill Springs, Fort Donelson, Pea Ridge, and Shiloh. Important cities such as Nashville, Memphis, Corinth, and New Orleans were in Union hands. George McClellan's Army of the Potomac was within 20 miles of Richmond, Virginia, and had defeated the Confederate Army at Williamsburg and Seven Pines. Union was so confident of victory, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton closed Union recruitment stations. In the midst of this tide of victory, the Union forces in South Carolina were also active. They captured Fort Pulaski, which sealed Savannah off from its direct access to the ocean. That left Charleston as the Confederacy's busiest port on the eastern seaboard. The city was the third largest in the South and called the Cradle of Secession. It was also home to some of the most virulent pro-slavery ideology. If captured, it would be a death blow to the tottering Confederacy. Charleston was guarded by 15,000 entrenched Confederates. They were led by John C. Pemberton. He was born in Pennsylvania, but married a woman from Virginia and joined the Confederacy. Although most of his family fought for the Union, he was hidebound, abrasive, uncreative, and owed his high rank to his wife's connections. He was, however, considered a superb artillery commander. Pemberton wanted to abandon the outer defenses of Charleston, including Fort Sumter, which enraged South Carolina politicians and civilians. Governor Francis Pickens bombarded Confederate President Jefferson Davis with requests to replace Pemberton with PGT Beauregard, the hero of Fort Sumter and the Battle of Bull Run. The Union forces in South Carolina were commanded by David Hunter. He was distrustful, uncharismatic, and cautious. He was one of the few high-ranking officers who was an outright abolitionist and was the first to begin raising black soldiers for the Army. Although a poor field commander, he had befriended Abraham Lincoln early in the war, which assured him a high rank. On May 13th, Robert Smalls, a local slave, escaped Charleston by commandeering the Planter, a rebel supply ship. It was one of the most daring escapes in American history. Smalls met with Hunter and indicated that most of Charleston's garrison had been transferred to Virginia. He also provided Hunter with details of the rebel defenses on James Island, just south of Charleston. Uncharacteristically, Hunter decided to attack. On June 2nd, Hunter began his offensive. One column, led by Horatio G. Wright, marched overland for James Island. Wright was a mediocre officer, uninspired and mostly noted for his arrogance. He owed his command and a string of future promotions to his friendship with Henry Halleck, who was one of the Union's highest ranking officers. Coming from the sea was another column led by Isaac Stevens. He was brave and blunt and unarguably the best fighting commander that Hunter had in his command. Stevens arrived on June 2nd. The offensive, though, was slowed by incessant heat. In addition, the rebels were led by states' rights Gist. His father named his son in honor of his hardcore states' rights politics. Gist was handsome, charismatic, and was an avowed secessionist. He was likely the best general Pemberton had under his command. On June 3rd, Gist skirmished with Stevens' men and succeeded in capturing a score of prisoners. On June 5th, Wright arrived and merged his force with Stevens. Despite the Union offensive, Pemberton was forced to send even more troops to Richmond, where Robert E. Lee was preparing a major offensive. Pemberton had no more than 3,000 frontline soldiers able to hold James Island. The next day, Pemberton sent William Duncan Smith to take over the defenses, replacing Gist, who was very upset over the decision. Smith was irascible, but a good tactician. He created a reserve centered around his best regiments, if the Union penetrated the line at any point, these regiments would attack that penetration. From June 5th to 10th, Wright ferried his men, and Union forces erected defenses. Rebel cannons fired constantly under the direction of Thomas Lamar, Pemberton's best artillery commander. Pemberton ordered Lamar to conserve ammunition while ordering Smith to probe the Union lines. On June 10th, a Confederate force led by Johnson Hoggood attacked. As the rebels advanced, Captain William Williams of the 47th Georgia cried out, Here are the Federal sons of bitches. Now then, boys, give them hell. However, the attack was easily thrown back. The Union victory led to a falling out between Pemberton and Smith. The two bickered, and Pemberton considered arresting him, but instead transferred a brigade commanded by Nathan G. Evans. 
nicknamed Shanks. He was a hero in the South due to his victory at Ball's Bluff and his brave stand at Bull Run. Yet Evans was a cantankerous alcoholic and a slob. His men were poorly disciplined, and Evans often went into battle with a jug of whiskey. Evans was a liability except in a fight. Regardless, Evans outranked Smith and took command, which was more to Pemberton's liking. Regardless, Evans, Smith, and Gist bickered. The Confederate command of James Island was in disarray. Although morale in the Union Army was high, Hunter was spooked by Smith's attack. He believed Pemberton had more men than Smalls had indicated and decided not to press forward. Hunter left on June 11th for Hilton Head, South Carolina, to visit his wife. While there, he wrote a message bombastically declaring, We have examined the works of the enemy, and they shall be ours. Hunter left command to Henry Benham, instructing him not to attack. Benham was a brilliant engineer and an expert in pontoon bridges. He was, however, considered to be cowardly and a drunkard. Wright openly disliked Benham. Stevens kept his thoughts to himself, but wrote that Benham was an ass, a dreadful man of no earthly use. Benham, for his part, despised Hunter. On June 14th, it was an artillery duel which the rebels won. Although it was against Hunter's orders, Benham decided to attack. He reasoned that his encampment was not secure with Lamar's accurate gunners lobbing shells at him. He also knew that if successful, Charleston would fall, and such a victory would quiet any accusations of disobedience. At 2 o'clock a.m. on June 16th, Benham discussed his attack plan with Wright and Stevens. He wanted Stevens to take the rebel position known as the Tower Battery. It was near Secessionville, a village named because it was founded by young planters who wanted to get away from their elders. It was not named after South Carolina's love of secession. Wright would support Stevens with an advance meant to pin the rebels just to the north while outflanking Tower Battery. Wright and Stevens opposed the move. The terrain was bad and had not been properly scouted. In addition, Benham wanted to attack at dawn at 4 o'clock a.m., giving the men little time to prepare. As the Union forces lined up, Captain Alfred Rockwell of the 1st Connecticut Artillery asked Stevens what the plan was. Stevens shot back, Damn it, sir, there isn't any plan. Despite the bad terrain and the hastily conceived plan, the Union had the advantage of numbers. Morale was also high. The Confederates, though, were lucky that Haga was in command at Secessionville. This was his first major battle, but he was by war's end considered one of the South's best fighting commanders. In the rain and the mud, the Union forces formed up. Benham wanted a bayonet attack, even ordering that the men not load their muskets, but many ignored the order. As the Union regiments rolled on, they overwhelmed Confederate pickets, giving the Union nearly complete surprise. As the 8th Michigan emerged from the gloom, Lamar fired his cannons, shredding the Union lines. Still, on they came, reaching the defenses just as men from the 22nd South Carolina arrived as a dawn relief. The 8th Michigan inflicted heavy losses before more rebels arrived. The lines engage in a short-range shooting contest, some men being only a few feet from each other. The 8th Michigan might have overwhelmed the rebels, but they had no support. The second Union line was bogged down in a marsh and came under accurate rebel cannon fire. The 79th New York, a Scottish unit, did attack right behind the 8th Michigan. The regiment was a veteran outfit, and they nearly stormed Tower Battery, only to be bested in close combat by the 9th South Carolina Battalion. Still, Lamar had at most 400 men at Tower Battery. The battle was far from lost for the Union. While Stevens attacked Secessionville, Wright made his advance. The third New Hampshire advanced on the flank of Tower Battery. The position might have fallen, but Smith had kept the 4th Louisiana Battalion in reserve. Hagood ordered them forward, and the unit stopped the flank march. While Hagood led the 1st South Carolina and the Utah Battalion right down on Wright's men, preventing them from supporting the attack on Tower Battery. A charge by the Louisiana men forced Wright to fall back. Stevens wanted to attack again, but Benham declined. Stevens fell back, his men doing so slowly, some staring at the Tower Battery they had nearly carried. The rebels cheered and collected whatever supplies the Union left behind. Pemberton arrived hours later and ordered up more troops and arranged the defenses, ending the Union's last hopes of storming Tower Battery and taking Charleston.
three hours of combat, the Union lost 700 men out of 4,500 engaged. Nearly 200 from the 8th Michigan were lost alone. When Stephen was given the casualty report, he broke down and cried. Rebel losses were 150, but were almost entirely a tower battery. Lamar's gunners suffered high losses. The reasons for the Union defeat were the poor terrain, rushed attack plan, and Benham's skittishness. Benham was even accused of cowardice and drunkenness. Yet the Union came close to victory. Ultimately, the leadership of Lamar and Haga was decisive, while Smith, although not present, deserves credit for keeping a reserve. Yet the true heroes for the Confederates were the men. Many were Charleston natives and South Carolina locals. They fought fiercely to defend their homes and were the ultimate difference between defeat and victory. In the Union camp, the defeat caused a command crisis. Benham lied to Hunter and said it was only a reconnaissance in force. Stevens, though, would not stand for it and argue with Benham over the battle, even sending articles to the New York Times. Stevens was transferred to Virginia, where he died heroically at Chantilly. At the same time, Benham's promotion to general was revoked by an angry Lincoln. Benham, though, survived. Sent to the Army of the Potomac in 1863, he served superbly as an engineer, although he was never again trusted with a combat command. Hunter, for his part, was removed. He later won a battle at Piedmont, Virginia, only to be defeated at Lynchburg and permanently shelved. Wright went on to command the Union VI Corps, turning in his best performance at Cedar Creek. Among the Confederates, few profited from the victory. Pemberton was replaced with Beauregard, who openly criticized his defensive plans. Pemberton then lost Vicksburg. He chose a demotion in order to command artillery in the Richmond defenses. Evans was stripped of command by Beauregard. Two of the men responsible for the Confederate victory died only months later. Smith succumbed to yellow fever on October 4, 1862, days after Lamar died of malaria. The Tower Battery was renamed Fort Lamar, while Lamar's grave carried the simple honor, Hero of Secessionville. As for Hagood, he became a general and later governor of South Carolina. His memoirs are among the best written by a Confederate general. Outside of Stonewall Jackson's victories in the Shenandoah Valley, Secessionville was the first good news the Confederacy received in 1862. Morale was raised, but most importantly, Charleston remained Confederate. When Union made a major offensive to seize the city in 1863, the defenses were better prepared, and the garrison was larger and commanded by Beauregard, one of the South's best generals. Charleston held in 1863, and the city evaded capture in 1864. Charleston only fell in February of 1865 as William Tecumseh Sherman marched into South Carolina. Secessionville could have been one of the Union's biggest strategic victories and could have been the death blow to the Confederate cause. Instead, the battle was a prologue to years of fruitless efforts to capture the cradle of secession. <laughs>